and welcome to the crummy talk we are discussing domestic abuse on this episode for this month it's july and our theme is domestic abuse so we've got six people on the panel today and we've got the lovely mikhail we've got sam we've got lena we've got tyler and we've got tiffany i'm not sure how it's showing on your screen but um, that's i've said it in order um, and I just wanted to kind of throw out there in regards to criminology, domestic abuse is really imperative in understanding um, the theory, etc. So there you've got your individualist approaches, for example, like neo-Darwinism, um, where there's concepts of understanding how male evolution develops and you can look at it, domestic abuse from that lens. Um, you've got cycles of violence, you've got structural theories um, that kind of look into in, um, intrinsic um, social aspects of domestic abuse. Um, or you can even look at it from a more, it is criminological, but you can look at it from a um, sociological aspect as well. Um, and that can give you an as a concept where it kind of argues that um, the behaviour of the perpetrator is a reflection of how they feel towards the members of the family or an organisation or a set structure. So that's just a little whistle stop tour over um, criminological theory. Um, and as I've already introduced my panel um, already, um, I just wanted to brush over the fact that we've got two lovely guests with us today on the Crummy Talk. We've got Sam, Sam Billingham, um, a domestic abuse survivor. And we've also got Lena, I believe she's a student and she has done a beautiful petition um during thank the you covid19 period you're welcome um so i'll hand over to them um to talk briefly about themselves quickly before um and what they do um before we proceed with the questions so um sam would you like to go first thank you thank you for inviting me on it's a pleasure to be here so i'm a survivor of domestic abuse and i left my relationship in 2009 and then i set up my own support group called soda which is survivors of domestic abuse which is an online support group for anyone who has experienced domestic abuse. Lena? Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just a student and um, I set up the petition because I thought that during like COVID, like there was nothing, like especially the first few weeks, everyone was just, ev all people cared about was, you know, their businesses closing, them losing their jobs, but no one actually thought about oh my god look what's happening to these people who are like trapped in their homes and can't do anything because it wasn't until like a few weeks after where um i can't remember her name um yeah. uh, something is it i think pretty patel something oh. like that yeah when it was only a few weeks after when she introduced like oh you can actually leave your home if you're in danger only if you're like a domestic abuse victim and I just don't think there was enough awareness put out straight away. So, yeah, I've got a petition. Um, so I think everyone should sign it. Yeah, fantastic. I'll definitely sign that petition. Yeah, and I'll make sure that it's um, at the end of this video, you'll have all the relevant links, and that's to Soda and to um, the petition. If you want to sign it, well, you should want to sign it. But yeah, You should. Um, <laughs> you should want to sign it. <laughs> you should. Um, with that being said, I'm just going to ask, there's three questions, and I'm just going to ask the panel. I'd ideally love for you to all answer um, as best as you can. Um, so how would you personally um, define domestic abuse? Anyone? Um, I'll, yep. I'll jump in on this one. Uh, so with domestic abuse, the, um, the conversation surrounding how to define it has changed over time. As uh, Professor Stark says, um, says it, is that it was always considered a physical aspect in which we, that's how we measured and that's how we understood domestic abuse. But since then, the conversation has rightfully changed in the way we look specifically towards coerc a coercive control and, and so forth. And that has been... Uh, at, uh, added to the domestic abuse bill going forward, which adds emotional aspects as well as physical, uh, psychological, and economic factors as well. So I think we need to take into consideration of wider factors when understanding domestic abuse. With, with that being said, um, do you think that 
obviously like you say it was initially a kind of a physical thing um that's how it was people looked at it from the lens of it being a physical um, altercation between couples and within the home um obviously you've seen policing and a lot of structures change over the years um because of reforms and things like that and policy changes because they've realized it's more than just physical but do you think the change over time this isn't even one of the questions but um, do you think the change over time has been too slow um because I, I personally think there's a long way to go when it comes to helping domestic, ab- um, domestic abuse survivors and victims. Um, it's great that it's come so far, but I do think it's been slow. Um, so what are your views on that? Anyone? I completely agree that it's been quite slow, uh, but, and th- there is still a long way to go in, in regards to changing the stigma and the ideas surrounding domestic abuse. We still have a long way to go. Uh, anybody else want to jump in? Yeah, for me, domestic abuse is all about power and control. So with the perpetrator doing all they can to gain that power and control, like we've already said, it's not necessarily physical. It's about the coercive control. It's about the sexual abuse, the financial abuse. It's about controlling every aspect of their victim's life, from what they eat to when they sleep. And I think it's really important to kind of highlight that fact that it's all about power and control. And it often starts with isolation, not necessarily the physical abuse. And that's really important to highlight because a lot of people don't know they're a victim until it's too late. Yeah, I agree. Um, Anyone else got anything to add to those questions before we move on? Uh, I'd like to add something. Um, I think the emergence of sort of like understandings on mental health plays a big factor in defining domestic abuse as well because... um, I think the mental sort of torture that some people go through as a result is more understood now than it is sort of like um, before. Um, I did an interview with my sister who's been a victim and she said at the beginning she didn't even realise that any abuse per se was happening. Um, And this was sort of like going back 10, 15 years ago, so around 2005. So she didn't even know it came... It, it was even categorised as domestic abuse. So I think now, um, I think the mental psychological uh, factors are all sort of part of that as well. And I think it's more recognised as such as well. Yeah, that's the same for me. I'm similar to your sister. Mine was the early 2000s as well. And it was only when I left that I realised that I'd been a victim. But now we've got uh, coercive control, which is now a law. So in 2015, there was a female perpetrator who was actually jailed or controlling her male partner. So it, it's been a long and slow process, as you said earlier, that, but it is, it is coming to light. And I do think that COVID-19 has kind of highlighted that domestic abuse is happening like with Lena's petition. They've got no way to kind of have that break from their perpetrator during lockdown. It's kind of, they're, they're together so much that there is no way for them to make that call safely or to leave the house safely. So... In one respect, COVID-19 has kind of shone a light on domestic abuse. Um, And then adding to the question, I mean, your point, Tyler, about mental health and obviously the implications it has on domestic abuse victims, um, me just being the devil's advocate, um, do you think, obviously, there's definitely a need for mental health interventions when it comes to domestic um, abuse victims and survivors. Um, Do you think that, there could be preventative measures as well when it comes to domestic abuse perpetrators because we often see, um, you know, we hear the rhetoric about, you know, this domestic abuse, abuser, sorry, um, alcoholism and things like that. And you, you, you do hear of case studies and this isn't me sympathising with anyone at all, just to throw that out there. This is just me um, drawing on things I've read. Um, but you hear stories about people that have uh, committed domestic abuse against their victims because they've got, their own personal issues and their own mental health um, related matters. So I think with that being said, it would be great if there was more of a mental health intervention to prevent um, domestic abuse situations, as well as everything else um, that we've got in place and everything else that needs to be put in place. Um, I'm not sure if anyone shares that view, but that's just me. um, Yeah, It's funny you mentioned that because my sister mentioned something similar to that about um, sort of her abuser himself sort of having having some underlying issue. But what she said surprised me because what she said was the fact that maybe within like, sort of the punishment, 
they, they could go into sort of giving mental help to him as opposed to her because he, he must have had a problem or something to even do it in the first place as opposed to the problems that he caused her in mm. a sense. Yeah. Your, your mic. Oh, yeah, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Um, slightly disagree. Um, perpetrators always need control, and perpetrators know exactly what they're doing. Unfortunately, they use alcohol, mental health issues as excuses to justify their behaviour and often to make their victims feel guilty or to make mm -hmm. them feel as though it's their fault. I'm not saying that not every perpetrator has mental health issues, but they often use those as an excuse to justify their behaviour. So we kind of say, oh, okay, they have had a bad day or they've had a bad childhood or oh, they've got mental health issues. Yeah. So then we excuse their behaviour. And the perpetrator knows that because they're always in control. So I slightly disagree. Uh, but you're right about how the perpetrator often gets the support for their mental health issues, but the survivor doesn't. Yeah. Um, do you have anything to add, Lena or Tiffany? Um, I think yeah. that... Um, I want to let, let Lena go first, that is fine. No, it's all right, carry on. Are you sure? Um, yeah. I think that the um, the media is a big problem because they like, reinforce a lot of the domestic abuse myths. So, um, and they tend to place blame onto the victims as well and justify the perpetrator's actions. So I think that might, although the law is changing, I think there definitely needs to be more, more to change those attitudes. Yeah. I think the media just as a whole, um, there's a lot of work that needs to, and a lot of regulation that needs to go on uh, with regards to that. But I definitely agree. Just definitely agree. Lena, did you? Yeah, um, I was just going to say about like the mental health. So, you know, if you go on like the gov gov.uk website and like the first thing that comes up under domestic abuse is like if you're an abuser, this is like a guide. It's quite, it just says, like, what you should do, like, maybe take, I don't know, counselling sessions, things like that. And I just think people who are the abuser are not going to think, oh, like, for example, I'm controlling my wife or something. Let me just go read, like, read up on this and see how I can stop doing it because they don't think like that. And if it was, like, the other way around where, like, for example, the wife offered her husband help, I don't. I think most of the time they take that in like a bad way because mm -hmm. they don't actually think what they're doing is wrong. Otherwise, they won't be doing it. I understand. I think I don't know if what I said kind of got like misconstrued or anything, but I think in a sense, I understand what you mean. The perpetrator, you know, they do it because they want the power and and things like that. But I'm I'm looking at it from a from a mental yeah. health perspective. So if I was a mental health practitioner. And I had, say, a patient and I identified certain things and I identified that there was domestic abuse because these are things that mental health practitioners and nurses, etc., should be privy to. They should be, you know, should be able to identify certain um, factors. I think as a whole, um, there should be some sort of, they should be able to, for example, they should be able to identify that there's a problem and they should be willing to kind of mitigate that problem because at the end of the day the risk is on them so if they identify well the risk isn't necessarily just on them it's on on the abu the the the, abu the, abu the abused should i say the survivor um but if they they identify certain things they should be putting referrals in and this should be normal this should be a normal procedure there should be referrals in so if, whether or not um you know the perpetrator takes it which we've kind of you know established that they probably won't because they enjoy the lifestyle that they live um but that should be in my opinion a standard procedure um to try and do something to to kind of keep to safeguard the victim as well um and if it means because i have an issue with you know just brushing an issue um issue under the carpet and moving on i think when you kind of baby the perpetrator so to speak you kind of letting them think that what they're doing is okay and it's not. Um, so that's what I meant in regards to, you know, mental health um, institutions having some sort of kind of influence over what happens. So I'm not, I wasn't siding or anything like that. Um, but that was where my thought process came from, because I don't really hear that much. I might be wrong. Someone will probably correct me in the comments, but um, I don't really hear that often that 
that much work goes into the perpetrators in regards to their mental health. I hear about the alcoholism, drug abuse, things like that. Um, but, but that's a personal change that I think would potentially help. Um, yeah. I've seen this as well, that perpetrators often don't want the help because they don't recognise their behaviour as being wrong. They don't see what they're actually doing is wrong. So it's kind of difficult to offer that support and that helps them if they're not going to accept it because for them to accept it, they've got to acknowledge that their behaviour is wrong and it's very, very difficult for them to kind of do that because then they're not in, in control then. So it's yeah. kind of really difficult, I think, that one is to kind of give them the support that they, that they might need. Yeah, I understand. It is quite a difficult one. Um, does anyone have anything to add? on that um, topic before I move on to the final question? No, not really. Okay. It's all good. Yeah. Um, <coughs> on to the last one. Um, so obviously we've discussed Lena's petition um, and she spoke briefly about what it is um, she does and, and why the why behind it. Um, but I just wanted to ask you all, do you think domestic abuse victims received suitable support throughout COVID-19 and that was before and after um, you know the rulings by Preeti Patel. Uh, well just in general the government should be held accountable for their lack of support for those who are going through domestic abuse just in general even before coronavirus um, so um, yeah from like the 1970s since the first wave of the, the second wave of the feminist movement in which there was a uh, more inquiry surrounding uh, domestic abuse, the government has been hasn't given enough um, funding towards um, institutions such as like uh, women's aid and so forth. So, and that has resulted into many institutions having to say not being able to take in survivors when they come to institutions. So, I think there is a element in which the government are, should be held accountable for their actions. Yeah, I absolutely agree. When I left my relationship, all I was offered was an eight-week awareness course of everything that I've been through, and it was a referral made by social services at the time, so I felt I had to go, otherwise I would take my daughter away from me. And then once the eight weeks were over, there was nothing. I wasn't handy help buying or signposted to anywhere at all, to the point where I decided to set up my own support group because, as you've just said, I just don't feel there's enough support out there for anyone who takes the courage to phone the police or to say I need help um, and as for uh, COVID-19 I saw the, um, the government's campaign where they drew a heart on their hand and said you're not alone. I kind of found that a bit degrading I guess um, because although they're saying we're not alone once somebody made that phone call to a helpline there was either no answer, the message went to an answer machine or there's a waiting list for them to get that support which isn't good because one, when a survivor reaches out and says, I need support, they need it there and then. And two, by the time the support is there, they could have gone back to their abuse out or even worse. So I think the government have got so much to do where support is, is um, concerned because it's all about, you know, the onus is on the victim. Why don't you leave? Why don't you leave? But if there's no support there or support network, then it's not safe for them to leave. Yeah, I think I think I read an article and um, it was about sort of um, domestic abuse rates rising worldwide. And when they talk about Britain, um, the person who wrote the report just mentioned the fact that the government states, like at the beginning of the strict lockdown measures, that it was only the same as what was offered anyway, even though there was a change in circumstance. So because of the change in circumstance, why wasn't there a change in support networks? Because the, these people feel like they're being forced to stay in the environment where they're being abused and why should they have to? You know, I know about the virus and everything, but so it, it's more support should have been there because of the change in situation. I agree. Because they're being forced to I stay. It, it was essentially kind of like what Sam, well, just to add to both of your points, it was definitely a slap in the face to domestic abuse victims. That's exactly what it was. Um, it was the government just saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. Would, you, they clearly didn't think about what they were doing and they 
And then it was, a few, I, I think it was even worse that it still took, despite, I, because I saw a lot of things on social media about people saying, you know, domestic abuse victims, they're not safe right now. This is not safe. Um, and it still took a couple of weeks for them to try and implement something. And in my opinion, it still wasn't enough. Um, and yeah, I think I love that to be prodded. Yeah, and it, and I think that, you know, to add to Mikhail's point as well, the government should be held accountable because that was, it, it's not fair. It's 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 not fair. Um, but does anyone else have anything to add? Um, I think that even though they announced that victims could leave despite the restrictions, I don't think it, like they really considered the circumstances. So if victims are suffering from financial abuse, how are they going to afford to like travel to somewhere else? Mm-hmm. And I don't think they considered that at the point where the victim leaves the relationship, they are at most risk of harm. And I don't think any of that was considered. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, they just didn't think it through at all. Lena, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, like all over the news as well. As soon as like like the topic domestic abuse like had a few more headlines, everyone was saying like, oh, there's a fifty percent rise in calls, and saying how many people like they can't cope with all the demand, and I just think. You can write an article about it, but then I think, like Sam said, think about all those people who might, like at the time, for example, say even if their partner's gone out or something, they might decide to like get the courage, go online or try to call someone, and then they're just put on hold. They don't have time to be put on hold. And they're just like, they really didn't do nothing to help her, which is like, it's just shocking, it really is. It's awful. Um, yeah. The whole thing just boggles my mind completely. Um, I recently sent you all um, an article that came out in The Guardian about um, the family court judges being given more powers when it comes to domestic abuse cases. Um, just to finish off, what are your views about that? And that's for everyone. I think it was something that was really needed because even though the victim may have been out of the, like, may have been out of the environment, the abuse in terms of harassment is still is still prevalent by them constantly taking them to court especially i think in cases where there are kids involved because they can easily just say oh i want my kids and they're not letting me have them so they just bring them again and again and again i think part of it was to stop that from happening and to stop encounters with them during sort of a court proceeding so with the separate exes and everything i think that was something really good that should be happening as well yeah, um, I've been through the family court. Um, my perpetrator tried to drag, drag me through the family court just to keep control, power and control over me. There was no indication that he really wanted to see his daughter. It was about that power and control, telling me when I had to go to court, um, telling his solicitor that he wanted me to do a drugs test, alcohol test, psychological test. So it's, again, it's all about power and control. And when I went through the family court, I've never been so scared in all my life. It was so intimidating. I, he literally sat next to me so that was really really scary because I've been with him for three years I know exactly what he's capable of and now I'm in a room literally sitting next to him so the, the new measures that they're putting in place the separate entrance and the screen I think it's been a long time coming really because those things might be small to someone but to, to a survivor of domestic abuse they are big things because it is very very scary going through family court Thank you. Um, Mikhail, Tiffany, do you have well, any- I just, I just jumping on what uh, Sam says, so yeah, it's, it was just a long time coming, as a, even though they may look like small amendments, but they just go through, uh, they help just so much, and I feel like we've still got a long way to go in these amendments. Yeah, I definitely. Yeah, I, I think that... Um, like it's good that they're making the environment of the family court safer by providing the victims with things like separate entrances. But I think they do need to take things further and tackle the attitudes that exist within the family court surrounding domestic abuse. Because there's no point making the actual environment of the family court safer if the decision that the judges make at the end of it puts victims at an increased risk of harm. Yeah, completely agree, definitely. Judges need extra training and training on domestic 
food and what it's all about. Again, it's about power and control. Even with contact between the perpetrator and the child, there's still coercive control that happens then as well. So it's kind of really complex. But as you say, Tiffany, you know, it's okay doing small things inside the family court, but what about what, what's happening with yeah. contact with the type place? There's no safe precautions there either. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you for that. Um, that brings us to the end of our discussion, unfortunately. Um, right, so um, that's, that brings us, again, I'm repeating myself, um, that brings us to the end of our discussion um, for the Crimea Talk for this month, and that was our domestic abuse episode. Um, do get in touch with Lena. The links down uh, will be below. Um, have a look at Soda and have a look at um, Sam's page. Um, again, the link is below continue to look at what we've got going on um, we'll be posting on instagram twitter um, facebook um, and you can have a look at us on our website as well thank you very much mikhail thank you sam thank you tyler thank you lena and thank you tiffany and we've been the crew thank you bye bye, bye.